Why don't you turn in your Bibles to Judges chapter 3. Judges chapter 3, if you're using one of the Bibles in the bench in front of you, it's page 202. Page 202, Judges chapter 3. When we come to the book of Judges, we come to a very specific time in the history of Israel, of God's people in the Old Testament. It's after uh, the Exodus, it's, it's at, at the, towards the end of the conquest of the Promised Land, but it's before the monarchy, before they have any kings. So Israel had been in Egypt, God raised up Moses to deliver them out of Egypt, out of slavery, led them into the wilderness, and gave them a promise that they would one day have their own land. Moses dies, and Joshua assumes the leadership role, and it's Joshua who gets to lead the people across the Jordan River into the Promised Land. The problem is that there are already tribes living in the Promised Land. In Scripture, all these different tribes in the Promised Land are kind of called Canaanites as a category. And scripture tells us that they were large, they were powerful, and they were deeply, deeply wicked. But God has promised to deliver the tribes into the hands of his people in order that they may possess the land he's given them. And we talked last week a little bit about the justification for the war against these tribes, that God was using his people Israel, God was using his people Israel to judge the wickedness and the sin of the Canaanite people. And, and God even goes out of his way a couple of times in scripture to tell Israel, look, I'm not giving you the promised land, and, and I'm not delivering these tribes into your hands because you're good. You're not good. <laughs> but it's because of the wickedness of the Canaanite tribes. So Joshua has now died, and the conquest of the land is incomplete. This is unfaithfulness on the part of Israel. They were commanded by God to remove the Canaanites fully from the land. But instead, they made peace or attempted to make peace with the Canaanites, and this would be a thorn in their side for generations. But the promise of the Lord still stands. He will deliver the land of promise into their hands if they will just believe and obey. The book of Judges is the word of God. He himself is its ultimate author, although he used people to write it. It's fully true in all that it affirms, and it's simultaneously filled with prophetic symbolism and gospel imagery that runs like a thread from the first page of the book of Genesis to the last page of the book of Revelation. In Judges chapter 17 and verse 21, we have chapter 17 and chapter 21, twice in the book of Judges, we have this refrain. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And so this encapsulates for us the problem for Israel. They needed a king, and they didn't have one. Let's read Judges chapter 3. Starting in verse 7, and we'll read all the way through the end of chapter 3. Now, first, it's going to tell us about a judge named Othniel. Now, Othniel is offered up at the beginning of the book of Judges as kind of a, he provides the, the, the outline for all the judges that come, like the, the rough general outline of the way things go. Failure, misery, grace, repeat. Right? So let's read verse 7. And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, they forgot the Lord their God and served the Baals and the Asherah. Therefore, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the people served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, the Lord raised up a deliverer for the people of Israel who saved them. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of the Lord was upon him, and he judged Israel. He went out to war, and the Lord gave Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand. And his hand prevailed over Cushan Rishathaim, so the land had rest for 40 years. Then Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Verse 12 And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel. Because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites and went and defeated Israel. And they took possession of the city of Palms. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, for 18 years. Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord. And the Lord raised up for them a deliverer. Ehud, the son of Gera, the, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. The people of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. 
And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length. That's about 18 inches, 15 to 18 inches. A cubit in length. And he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, the king of Moab. Now, Eglon was a very fat man. And when Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he sent away the people who carried the tribute. But he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence, and all his attendants went out from his presence. And Ehud came to him as he was sitting alone in his cool roof chamber. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And he rose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the excrement came out. Then Ehud went out into the porch and closed the doors of the roof chamber behind him and locked them. When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited. And by the way, that's the right response to laughter. This is a funny story. I just want you guys to know that. Surely he is relieving himself in the closet. Of the, by the way, do you know why they must have thought he was relieving himself? Do I? They could smell it. They could smell it. Okay. And he waited till they were embarrassed. But when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took the key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Syrah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. And he said to them, follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him and seized the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites and did not allow anyone to pass over. And they killed at that time about 10,000 of the Moabites, all strong, able-bodied men. Not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. Chapter 4, verse 1. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. All right, let's pray. God, we pray that you would give us uh, fresh eyes to see this story. God, if we've never heard this story before, Lord, I pray that you would allow your word to captivate our imaginations. Father, we pray that you would allow us to listen uh, to this story as you intended for us to hear it. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be with us to edify your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How do we listen to a story like this? How is it that we're to read a story about Ehud slaughtering this fat king and, and the excrement comes out of him and his servants think he might be using the bathroom, and so they're embarrassed. And while they're, while they're delaying because of the smell that makes them think he must be using the toilet, uh, our hero, our protagonist, slips out the door and escapes. What are we to make of a story like this that sees the people of God slaughtering 10,000 able-bodied men of the enemy? How do we listen to this story today in 2021? I think there are some ways of listening to a story like this in Scripture that might be a mistake. I think it would be wrong of us. I think we would make a mistake to hear this story and to be scandalized by some of the wrong things in it. It would be easy to read this and to be scandalized by the violence and the gore. The story is graphic at times. It's certainly violent. It's gross. It's scatological even. And we don't know what to do with these things when we encounter them in, encounter them in Scripture. But if we read Scripture, if we're students of Scripture, we will know... That violence like this occurs in Scripture with some frequency. We're not used to hearing these things in Scripture, nonetheless, because we don't normally go to those kinds of passages in our study, and we're certainly not used to hearing these kinds of details in church. I would encourage us this morning not to be scandalized by the wrong things in this story. Don't be scandalized by the violence and the gore in this story. We may be tempted to be scandalized that God would send a deliverer to Israel who uses deception to assassinate a monarch. We might be scandalized by the deception and the death of this story. Can this really be the way of God? Deception and assassination? Is our God a God who wages war? 
What are we to do with this? These are legitimate questions to ask. They're good questions. They're necessary questions. And we will get to questions like these eventually in the weeks to come, but I hope this morning you'll simply be patient and allow those questions to sit in your mind, to reserve judgment, and to not be scandalized by these notions. Instead, I hope we can listen to this story like an ancient Israelite would listen to this story. Maybe like an Israelite youth being told this story by his family. I hope we'll hear this as a story of the way God once delivered Israel in the time of the judges before they had a king. I hope we'll hear this story and recognize that the Moabite king Eglon was oppressing Israel. It was war, and this king had no right to do what he did, to take possession of the city of Palms, which was, by the way, the city of Jericho. God himself had given that land and that city into the hands of his people, and Eglon, the king of Moab, is an enemy of the Lord and of his people. He is an invader. He has no rights to the land. He has no rights to the tribute that he's requiring from the people of Israel. Eglon is, in this story, the enemy, the bad guy. I hope we'll hear this story and recognize that Israel was under the direct command of God to rid the land of tribes like Eglon represented, who practice wickedness in the worship of their gods, like child sacrifice and all kinds of other perversions. I hope we'll read this story and hear that the Israelites were suffering under the weight of Eglon's oppressive reign for 18 years. I hope we'll hear this story as a story of deliverance and mercy for God's people. I hope we'll hear it as a story of God's victory in the world. I hope we'll be surprised when the story is surprising, that we'll laugh when it's funny, that we'll cheer when the hero wins and the, and the, and the villain is defeated. That's how we're meant to receive this story. If we must be scandalized, I hope we'll be scandalized by the right things. I hope we'll be scandalized by the sin of Israel, by their forgetfulness of their God, by their continued rebellion and idolatry, even though God saves them again and again, they continually forget his salvation and turn to worship the wicked gods of the surrounding culture. That's what should scandalize us. I hope that you and I aren't different than the people of Israel, not in our hearts. That we look at our lives and we see cycles of chaos and rebellion and misery and God's grace coming in to rescue. And after a time, we return to the same kinds of sin and chaos and rebellion and misery. And God is good once again. I hope we'll be scandalized by the amazing grace of God who saves people who do not deserve it. A God who hears us cry even in our sin, even when we're experiencing the just consequences of sin in our lives, the shame, the embarrassment, the oppression that comes into our lives through our own sin, and we cry out, and he still delivers his people. Hope we'll be scandalized by the grace of the gospel. What we see in this story of Ehud slaying Eglon is that God continues to deliver us in ways that are unlikely. Our salvation seems unlikely. Ehud was an unlikely deliverer for the people of Israel. You guys know, you know what I had for the first time? For the first time in my life a couple weeks ago, I had one of you request more wrestling illustrations. That's a true story. So here you go. Actually, this one's jujitsu. So I go to jujitsu. Normally, at jiu-jitsu, it's, it's like wrestling, but instead of trying to pin a guy to the mat, it's, uh, it's like choke holds and joint locks and stuff, right? Um, sometimes at jiu-jitsu, you'll see a guy there, and he looks big and strong and mean and scary, and then you, you roll with him, you grapple with him, and in fact, he, he's big and mean and strong and scary, and he's really good, right? But sometimes, you'll see a guy who doesn't look scary at all. There's a guy at my jiu-jitsu place, who's smaller, probably weighs about maybe 130. He's in shape, but he doesn't have big muscles. He doesn't look scary at all. In fact, he looks a bit bookish. He looks like Harry Potter a little bit. And he's quiet, he's meek, he's humble, he's kind. 
and an absolute monster on the mats. I mean, he beats me quite handily every time we've grappled. I can do, very, I, if I can just hold my own for six minutes against him, I'm doing great. I can never beat him. And he usually submits me two or three times in a six minute roll. You look at him and it's very unlikely that he would be this competent, this strong, this. But once you roll with him, you recognize it's absolutely, absolutely inevitable. The ending is inevitable. In books and commentaries, much is made of the fact that Ehud is left-handed. Left-handed people today are a minority, and there are some inconveniences associated with being left-handed, as left-handed people frequently tell me. Scissors, the safety on a handgun, the way a guitar is built. All of the world seems to be designed for right-handed people. Left-handedness was rare in the ancient world as well, and there also seems to have been some stigma associated with being left-handed in the ancient world. In the Bible, it's the right hand that's considered the good hand. The right hand is the hand of power, it's the hand of confidence, it's the hand of privilege. God, God swears oaths by his right hand. Jesus ascends to the throne of the Father and sits at the right hand of God. And so Ehud's left-handedness in the context of Scripture made him seem like an unlikely deliverer. But also we have a clue in this that the phrase in the Hebrew, where it says left-handed, the phrase in the Hebrew is actually a man bound in his right hand. Even his left-handedness is described with respect to his right hand, that he has an inability in his right hand. Now, some people speculate this means that his left hand was disabled, that it was paralyzed, that it may have been deformed, perhaps. And if this is the case, even more so would we be surprised to see one such as Ehud be raised up by God to be a deliverer for his people. Maybe some of you think this is stretching it, but listen. When it says that he's of the tribe of Benjamin, he's a Benjaminite, right? You know what Benjamin means in the Hebrew? Son of my right hand. The story is setting us up for an unexpected, unlikely deliverer of God's people. Ehud, who is a son of the tribe of Benjamin, son of my right hand, yet has an inability to use his right hand. He's left-handed. The text brings to us a left-handed man from the tribe of the son of my right hand, and it seems to suggest he's a misfit of sorts, or at least there's something incongruent about Ehud, or something surprising or unlikely about him. The expectations that some would have of him in his life might not be met. The expectations they might have of a deliverer who would be used by God to conquer their enemies might not be fulfilled by Ehud, but that's who God chooses. God selects the unlikely, to deliver his people. And poor old Eglon, the fat king, never saw it coming. Ehud has the sword strapped to his right thigh because he would draw the sword with his left hand. But everybody else was right-handed and the sword would be strapped to their left thigh. So maybe this is how Ehud is able to get so close to the king and, and pass the guards and pass the servants without having the sword detected. Some have said that they would check for a sword or, an, or, or, or a dagger on your, on your left side because that's where you would keep it if you were going to assassinate someone. So the left-handedness, the very attribute that makes him an unlikely deliverer is the thing that God uses for his victory. The weakness of his right hand is not an issue at all for the Lord. Ehud has faith in the Lord. He, like the other judges, has been given the Holy Spirit of God for this purpose, and so he has courage. The unlikely, surprising Savior is successful in his endeavor. This is how God works throughout Scripture. Our Savior, our Deliverer, the one who conquers our enemies, came to us as a baby in a manger, born to a peasant girl in Bethlehem where there was not even any room for them in the inn, and we forget this, that a manger is not a normal place for a baby to be. It's a box that livestock would eat out of. Could God really use a baby born to a peasant girl who's far away from her home with no place to stay on the night that her child is born? Could he really use that baby to deliver his people? seems unlikely if you're not familiar with the story but that's precisely what god does 
a carpenter's son from Nazareth. Could that be the savior of God's people? Does anything good come from Nazareth, they asked? A man nailed to a cross. We have to remember that a cross at the time that Jesus was crucified had no previous religious connotations. It had criminal connotations. This man who was executed like a common criminal by the Roman Empire and laid in a tomb that was not even his own? Could God use a defeated religious revolutionary like Jesus who was executed like a common criminal? Could he use somebody like that to be our deliverer? But that's precisely what we see in the gospel. When Jesus was nailed to the cross and buried in the tomb, Satan must have thought he had the final victory. Finally, his plan worked to kill the sons. Moses slipped through his fingers. Jesus slipped through his fingers when he went to execute all the babies, right, through Herod. But now, finally, he catches up with this one who's called the Son of God and has him crucified. Through his instrument, the Roman state, the evil empire, Finally, Satan thinks he has the final victory, but he didn't anticipate the empty tomb, the resurrection. And the enemies of God never saw it coming. How unlikely is it that God would entrust the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the one message that can reconcile men and women with their creator? How likely is it that God would entrust that message to the church of all institutions? In all our deformity and dysfunction, in all our inefficiency, look, man, Amazon's getting it done, right? Amazon, you can order anything from Amazon. Right now, you could all, you could all pick out, you could get out your phone, and you could push a couple buttons, and tomorrow you would have whatever product you wanted waiting for you at your front door, right? Amazon is an institution that's efficient and gets it done. I would think if you were God and wanted to disseminate your gospel widely across the whole world, you would choose an institution like Amazon. But he doesn't. He chooses the church. How unlikely is it that he would choose the church? Believing, sometimes only half-heartedly, spiritually weak, two steps forward, one step back. But, but Scripture tells us in Romans chapter 16, verse 20, that's under the feet of the church that God will eventually crush Satan. How can that be? Or have you, have you ever thought how unlikely it is that God would use the Bible to advance his purposes in the world? An old book written long before the advent of modern science or modern political theory, authored through the writings of ancient people with their antiquated ideas about mankind and God and the world and we can wonder, how can this book be used to deliver anybody from anything? And yet we are told this book, God's Word, is a double-edged sword of God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Bible, God said, is like the two-edged sword of Ehud that penetrates deep into us. Verse 13 says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. As, as unlikely as it seems, God uses the Bible, he uses scripture as a means to slay the one who is perhaps our greatest enemy, and that is our own sinful hearts. Throughout God's word, he delights in using the unlikely to bring salvation to his people. And he did it with Ehud, and he did it with Christ, and he does it through the church, and he does it through the Bible. And as unlikely as it seems, in hindsight, it's all absolutely inevitable. If we're paying attention, as we're reading through this story in Judges chapter 3, Eglon didn't see it coming, but we, we can see it coming if we pay attention to some clues that are dropped there. One thing would be this, that, that we wouldn't know unless we were super well acquainted with Scripture. But the tribe, Benjam Benjaminites, 
Did you know the tribe of Benjamin were known as skilled warriors? Listen, way back in Genesis, chapter 49, as Jacob is dying and he's, he's giving blessings to his sons, he says this about Benjamin. Benjamin is a ravenous wolf in the morning devouring the prey and at evening dividing the spoil. The blessing upon Benjamin and his, and his descendants is that they will be mighty warriors. Later on in the book of Judges, we read about this. The people of Benjamin mustered out of their cities on that day 26,000 men who drew the sword. Besides the inhabitants of Gibeah, who mustered 700 chosen men, among all these were 700 chosen men who were left-handed, and every one could sling a stone at a hair and not miss. The men of the tribe of Benjamin were known throughout the Old Testament as being mighty warriors, but we also know they had a proclivity for fighting with their left hands. In 1 Chronicles chapter 12, verse 2, it says this, They were bowmen and could shoot arrows and sling stones with either the right hand or the left hand. They were Benjaminites. So if you're Israel, if you're Israel and you're reading this story, outsiders might read this story and say, A left-handed man from the tribe of the son of my right hand, well, he's, he's, there's no way God can use somebody like a misfit like that to deliver his people, but we're reading it with the ears and the eyes of those who know the history of God's people, who are well acquainted with his word, who understand his word as a double-edged sword, and we've been saturated in it from our youth, right? We're reading it with those eyes, we're listening with those ears, we say, tribe of Benjamin, <laughs> oh, and you say he can't, he can't use his right hand? Oh, you don't say. <laughs> right? Even the name Ehud means strong. Others might read and see a disabled man. But we read with eyes of faith and see one who was perfectly prepared and placed in the world in just the right way at just the right time to bring the inevitable salvation of God's people. We read and see that Eglon, the king, required tribute to be brought. This was an offering. In the Bible, the word here used for tribute is used as an offering made to God. This means not only was Eglon's requirement for tribute to be brought to him an economic hardship for Israel, it was social humiliation for Israel, and it was also blasphemous. Because only Yahweh is the king of his people. Only Yahweh has the right to require this kind of offering from his people. And this kind of offering had religious overtones for Israel. Only the Lord has the right to require this kind of devotion and loyalty from Israel. And Eglon most certainly does not have the right to Israel's fealty, to their devotion, to their loyalty. And so from the start, if we read with eyes of faith and we know, ah, what Eglon is requiring of them is something that only Yahweh can require of his people. A showdown is coming. And the tribute is bought. And this is where our English translation, I think, should maybe have a little, what do I know? I don't know anything. This is what I think. When it says that Ehud brings the tribute, in the Hebrew, it actually says the tribute was brought by the hand of Ehud. Left-handed, tribe of Benjamin, son of my right hand, brings the tribute by his hand. Oh, and the name Eglon, do you know this? Do you know what it means? It means the calf. The king is a fat calf. Why do you fatten a calf? slaughter, right? We read with eyes of faith that we can see it coming from the beginning. The salvation is inevitable. This one that seems so unlikely that God raised up, we know what's going to happen. We don't know how, but this fat calf tyrant king is going to be slaughtered. Eglon, the tyrant king of Moab. We now see his whole life and all of his conquests and all of his victories by which he fattened himself on the offerings of his subjects. Now we see all of this was merely God, the true sovereign king of all kings, was merely fattening him like a calf for the slaughter. A tribute is brought to Eglon, but the sacrifice is offered to Yahweh, and the people are delivered when the enemy is defeated at the hand of an unlikely deliverer like Ehud. Listen, our idols, the things in our lives and in our culture which demand our allegiance and our loyalty, and that's always what an idol does. That's always what a false god does. It demands sacrifices from us. Our idols will require all kinds of sacrifices from us, will require things that we can only rightfully give to God. 
our ultimate loyalty, our ultimate faithfulness. There are all kinds of ways which your, your idols, the things which you are truly serving with your hearts, right? Other than Jesus, whether it's your career, or whether it's finances, or whether it's your education, or whether it's status, or whether even good things like your family you can serve in place of God, whether it's your, your romantic relationships, those things, when you, when you give your heart devotion to them, they will require more and more and more from you. And you'll find yourself over time making compromises you never thought you would make. That's the perfect time to do what Israel did and to cry out to the Lord who will deliver you even in the midst of your sin. God longs to deliver you from the false gods and the tyrants who are requiring things of you that you can only rightfully give to the Lord. Your faithfulness, your loyalty, your heart. Eglon, the tyrant king of Moab, we now see all his success, all his victory, all of his intimidating presence was merely preparation by God himself for the slaughter. By the end of the story, Eglon, the tyrant king of Moab, is left naked and exposed and covered in his own excrement, and his servants are outside the door, embarrassed, covered in shame, and they're confused. One day the people of Israel would be given a king, a king who himself would be stripped naked, exposed, and hung on a cross, pierced with a blade, and our sin and shame would cover him in order that we might be made clean, in order that our shame might be removed. This is Jesus, and this is the king that all of these stories ultimately point us to. In chapter 4, verse 1, we see that Israel returns to their sin and their shame, as soon as, as Ehud dies, and, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. This is the pattern we see throughout the book of Judges. The people, the, the people turn from the Lord, they experience misery, they cry out to the Lord, the Lord raises up a deliverer to deliver them, and then, and then they're, they're blessed and they have peace, and then the deliverer, di deliverer dies, and then they return immediately to their idolatry and their sin. There are, there are lots of problems in the lives of these judges. As we go on, the judges' lives get more problematic. Here's, here's what I'll tell you. Uh, Ehud, this is, this is as good as they get. <laughs> they only get more problematic after this, right? But one of the main problems was that they didn't live forever. So none of these leaders that the Lord raised up and filled with the Spirit to lead his people, none of them could ensure the faithfulness of the people forever because they didn't live forever. What we need is a king who will live forever. A king who will conquer the sin in our hearts. A king who will address our need to be delivered from all kinds of idolatry and all kinds of sin. We need a king who will deliver us from everything that seeks to oppress us and who will not die so that our hearts are captivated by him forever so that our enemies will stay conquered, so that our sin will stay forgiven, so that death will stay dead, so that we might live with him forever. And that's precisely what we have in Christ. Praise God. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful that you've given us Christ. Lord, we're grateful that we will never know what it's like to be people without a king. Father, we pray that you would deepen uh, our apprehension of what it means to be Christ's people, for him to be our king. Father, we pray that you would continually show us the way that he seeks to deliver us from the remnants of sin in our own hearts. Father, we pray that you would remind us that we are forgiven and that we are made clean from our shame. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.